saw everybody arrive at the start of the King and Queen of the Ring, when Gunther turned up, Michael Cole said, ah, oh, there he is, the potential King General. I was like, I'm sorry, Mike, that is absolutely not a thing. Well, so hello, my friends, and welcome to yet another episode of Ups and Downs, and I agree with you. My bald head is coming at you way too much, which sounds absolutely dodgy, and I have said it out loud, and there's another premium live event later, too. I mean, some people say there's too much sports entertainment on television, but you know what? I agree with them. Everybody needs to calm down, so let's up those downs. So we'll start with the pre-show, and I shall keep it quick, because no one needs more of my moaning. It's boring. I'm a moaning mini. But it was Bianca Belair and Jay Cargill defending their women's tag team championships against Candice LeRae and Indy Hartwell. And of course they won. I mean, what were you expecting? It was more obvious than me being bald. What? Now I did actually quite enjoy this, especially Jay and Bianca's finish, where they do a DDT and they push off into a wheelbarrow suplex. But I just can't get over the fact that we put the women's tag team titles on the pre-show. I don't know why we call it the pre-show anymore. We call it the showcase, whatever it is. But we really need to get behind these belts more than any other title in the company. Because again, we kind of keep treating them like trash. You also didn't help. This was totally random too. It was just people going, ha ha, geese title shot. But look, it was quite entertaining. So I am going to give it an up. But for all the hoopla around it, I'm giving it a down. I mean, it's Bianca Belair and Jay Cargill. They're like proper top stars. So treat them like top stars. When the pay-per-view did start properly, excuse me, premium live event, I was so damn happy. Because I predicted that Liv Morgan was going to walk away as a brand new women's champion. And I had some people tweeting me going, eh, I can't believe you said that. You're such an asshole. Now look, I am an asshole, but not because of this. I was damn right. And really it did make sense because all those weeks ago when we had the Battle Royal, what is a better scenario? Liv Morgan winning a random Battle Royal or Liv Morgan beating Becky Lynch, who is the biggest star or the biggest woman star in WWE, one-on-one -on -one at a pay-per-view, excuse me, premium live event. Exactly, this was well thought out. There was also a story here too that we'll get into in just one second. And they started off by wrestling, then they were brawling, and then Becky did that top rope leg drop she loves to do. Although well, really, it's not that great. It never pins anyone. Becky then wanted to disarm her, but Liv was able to turn it into a code breaker for the one 2 ooh. When Bex went back up to the top rope, and that was a silly Billy move, because Morgan had learned and she got out of the way. Liv still tried for oblivion, but instead got DDT'd by Becky Lynch when she was going for the manhandle slam when Morgan got the most devastating move. In all a sports entertainment surprise roll-up, it did not work one too. Liv then tried to springboard, meaning she hasn't been watching wrestling TV lately because the failure rate of that is through the roof. She jumped right into the disarmor, and I was like, well, now you're absolutely cooked. But she wasn't. Because instead they actually traded submissions with Morgan locking in the rings of Saturn. But when that didn't work, do you know who came to ringside? Dominic Mysterio and his moustache. Now, Becky couldn't believe that another wrestler had come out here, so she totally forgot she was in the match when she turned around and she got hit with the code breaker. ruh -roh. She still kept going, though, because Lynch was able to get back to the top where she hit a superplex, but Dominic Mysterio didn't like that at all, and he threw a chair in the ring. Now, it's important that you do note, the commentators were like, oh my gosh, he's only doing this because he doesn't want Liv Morgan to win Rhea Ripley's title, because, of course, who took out Rhea? It was Liv. He had distracted the referee, though, so it was Morgan who was able to take advantage, and she DDT'd Becky Lynch onto that chair when she hit the Oblivion, and she got the one, two, three. And, of course, these two are in cahoots, because not only does Liv Morgan now own Rhea Ripley's title, but it looks like she owns her man, too. So this is going to be completely messy, which I do like, and I thought all of this was very well played out, because, of course, I assume Becky Lynch can now go and take that holiday she was meant to take to begin with, Although later on she did a cut a promo, she's like, I have a rematch cause and I'm cashing it in on Raw, so maybe we're going to get a big angle too. But I thought this was a very good start. Let's get it up. When Sami Zayn, Bronson Reed and Chad Gable just went to work. Sheesh. The Intercontinental title was on the line and these three just decided they were going to go so hard. And they totally smashed it. This was great. It helped because the crowd just loved Sammy, who started off really well here. But I think Bronson got a bit offended because he grabbed both he and Chad Gable and he did a double slam. And I was like, well, that does make sense. Look at him. He's a hoss. Somehow the bad guys ended up on the outside. So Sami Zayn did indeed do a dive. I was like, thank goodness for that. I forgot it was 2024 wrestling, but this was a timely reminder. He also went nuts because he actually tried to hit the least devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the Blue Thunder Bomb on Bronson Reed. But of course that didn't work. He must have never played WWF No Mercy. And instead Reed turned around and he smacked him one. Not like it would have made a difference. That move sucks. It really did piss Reed off as well, so he got into position to do the Tower of Doom spot. But when he went for a moonsault and miss, instantly Chad Gable came in with a moonsault for his own, and he got a one-two-ooh. 
And I was like, damn boys, you're doing a good job. Ted then remembered he could also fight as well, so he applied the ankle lock, when Sami Zayn was also applying the ankle lock, as we had this weird three-way. And when they busted out of this, that's right, Sami did hit the least devastating move in all of sports entertainment, the blue thunder bomb, onto Bronson Reed. And listen, this looked incredibly impressive, because again, Bronson is massive, but did it get the one, two, three? No, it didn't, and you wanna know why? because this bro sucks. We were then trading German suplexes v Gates when it ended with Chad Gable Germaning everyone, which is a funny way to put it. But this is when I just started clapping. This may as well have been the match of the night. At this point, Chad was done though, and given that he had told Otis at the start of this match, you wait for my call, boy. He went to the outside and he said, it's time, it's time, damn it. And he held Sami Zayn, but of course, Otis didn't want to do this. And he had a crisis of confidence, especially because Chad then walked up to him and he gave him a slap. I suppose that must have knocked the sense into him because Otis then went to hit Sami Zayn, but you know the deal. Sam got out of the way and Otis absolutely wrecked Chad Gable. And I was like, oh, I think you're in trouble when we get to Raw. Bronson Reed was totally dead by this point too, so Sami Zayn got back in the ring and he hit the halluva kick to get the one, two, three and keep the Intercontinental title. This is exactly what I wanted to happen because now we can do Chad versus Sami at the SummerSlam. And I think Gable should win there and become the Intercontinental Champion. So all this is absolutely fire, and I'm giving it up. Boris Saxton was then talking to Jay Cargill and Bianca Belair in the back, and he said, what's the secret to your success? They turned around and said, there is no secret. And I was like, well, thanks for that. What a waste of my life. When it was time to crown the Queen of the Ring, once again, this reminded me why I am terrible at predictions. I got it totally wrong. Now, yes, I did say that Liv Morgan was going to win the championship, but that also led me to go that Lyra Valkyria will become the Queen of the Ring, because then we could do that match at the next pay-per-view premium live event, because, of course, on Raw, Liv Morgan had slapped Lyra. That didn't happen, and Nia Jax is now royalty. As ever, though, Nia just played the monster here. And at one point, Lyra was just elbowing in the head, and Jax went, I don't care about that, and she gave her the Samoan drop which is totally fine, she is Samoan. Nia then tried for an early Annihilator, which she was gonna go for again and again and again, but when that did fail, they rolled to the outside, when Valkyria reversed whatever she was gonna do, and she hit Nia with a bulldog on the outside. So once again, these guys had their working boots on. She also hit a Tornado DDT for a one 2 ooh, when Nia once again tried for the Annihilator part two, but that didn't work. I was a bit like Jack, you probably should try something else. Instead, Lyra was able to hit the big leg drop from the top, so she must be watching Becky Lynch, but she definitely wasn't watching Sami Zayn, because she tried for Nightwing, and she too wasn't able to pick up Nia Jax, because nobody but nobody is playing WWF No Mercy. If you're a smaller character, and you try and pick up a big character, you're not able to do it, and your guy, your persona does this. Oh because their back can't handle it. It also led to the most horrific finish, which sent shivers through my spine, because when they were fighting on top of Tina the Turnbuckle, Lyra was like, well, I'm going to hit you with a sunset bomb. But when she was coming down, Jax turned her into the Annihilator and pinned her for the Uno Dos Tres. And listen, I'm glad that did happen, because this looked absolutely brutal. I suppose in the way that it was meant to, you were never going to come up with anything better than that. It also means that Nia Jax is the queen of the ring, and I do think that she's earned it, especially because we can do Nia versus is Bailey at SummerSlam, which also works. And afterwards, she did cut a promo where she said, I know no one is happy for me, but I am happy for myself. I was like, there's probably actually something in that, and it's a lesson we could all learn from. But I am going to give it an up because I thought this was pretty good. And again, we got a definite winner and we got a definite loser. And throughout the thing, I couldn't really pick them, so they did take me on a journey. So yeah, up and good for Nia Jax. She's been great ever since she has come back. She deserved it. Of course, we went right into the men's King of the Rings final after this too. Gunther versus Randy Orton. And it was the same thing. I mean, I had predicted Randy, but it's Gunther for the love of everything. And I thought this absolutely ruled. That's how WWE sold it too, as if it was two warriors going to war. Damn it, I screwed it up. It also began with wrestling, because Orton, of course, didn't want to get chopped when Gunther worked him into the corner. <laughs> he just chopped him. And Randy sold this so well, he was part annoyed and part like, oh my gosh, my chest is going to cave in. Good then went for the bomb of power, but Orton was able to dodge that. And he tried for the RKO, but it's way too early. And given that Randy's arm was just dangling there, the ring general went after that. And I was like, man, you can't work over that limb. Orton's already got a bad leg from the other match. He'll be totally screwed. And also, many went back to the chops as Orton started to cry. And when he went for his power slam, it ties into what I just said. His legs started to give way. And once again, 
as the announcers told us, oh my gosh, Randy Orton is breaking down, and that's not the position you want to be in when you're taking on Gunther. He even struggled when trying to do the draping DDT, which is when Gunther went to the top rope, but when he missed from there, Randy smashed him with the RKO, but once again, he was just too hurt, and he wasn't able to make the cover, so the ring general rolled out of the ring. So he abandoned his friend, Oh, I mean, Randy still made sure to slam Gunther into Allen announce table, not once, but twice, but three times. But once again, Allen refused to break. And when they got back in the squared circle, Gunther grabbed that leg and he applied a half Boston crab. Now, on the one hand, that makes all the sense in the world because Randy was dying. But on the other, Gunther is most definitely not from Boston. He has won matches with that in the past, though, so you could believe this may be the finish. But when Orton wiggled out, he hit the RKO. And if you can believe it, Gunther kicked out at the 1-2-0. And I was like, man, are we protecting this guy? Orm was so frustrated, he kind of stared off into the distance, which was going to be his undoing, because Gunther kind of shook off the cobwebs when he grabbed him and hit the most devastating move in all of sports entertainment. The surprise roll up, and he got the three, and this was my face. I couldn't believe it. Gunther felt like this was justified afterwards as he cut a promo too and promised that he was going to become the world championship at SummerSlam. No, the world champion. He's not going to become a title belt. But there was controversy here because we saw the replay and damn it, Randy Orton's shoulder was not on the mat. Dun, dun, dun. I do think this was intentional though because Triple H addressed it on social media afterwards. He said, listen, the referee's decision is final. But as soon as Randy Orton is good to go, I think we got to do Rand too. You bet your ass. Still, I thought this was great because it was good wrestling with good stories. And once again, we didn't have any shenanigans, which I don't want in a tournament. And it's done the world of good for Gunther. Even if there was a little bit of, wait a minute, what about his shoulders? Because he can walk around saying, I don't care. I pinned him. It's totally getting an up. And I'm excited for what's next. Triple H also confirmed at this point that it is going to be Drew McIntyre versus Damian Priest at the Clash of the Castle show in Scotland for the World Championship because Drew has been cleared. And I think these fans in Saudi Arabia thought that it was about to happen right now. I was a bit like, come on. It also meant that our main event was next. And I'll be honest with you, I overthought it. So I just couldn't work out why now was the time to do Cody Rhodes versus Logan Paul. But given everything, I just assumed someone from Saudi Arabia said, well, we would like to see it. So we got it. It was a reminder how good Logan Paul is, though, no matter what you think about him as a person. And Cody is just the best. Although early on, he found himself on the outside and Logan hit him with a cross body because of course he did. Logan Paul then applied the abdominal stretch. And I was like, give me more 1980s moves because it always makes me please. When one of his buddies was at ringside and started to help out, and I was like, who are these people? They indeed did pass in the brass nuts, so I suppose he didn't have them on him. So he is a liar, but he's kind of telling the truth. But he's still a goober. And he took these and he punched Cody right in the stomach, or the tum-tum. So now we were teasing, Ugh, Rhodes is hurt, maybe he's going to lose. And if we had done that, I would have had a meltdown. We didn't. He then got in a row with the referee about this, which was when Cody recovered and he hit the dive. When he applied the figure four, that's when I had a moment. I was like, I'm watching Cody put a figure four on Logan Paul. How the flub has this happened? It also continued because Cody was able to hit a Cody cutter using Barry Barricade. When the ref was like, well, I better start counting to 10. When Rhodes is like, no, I don't want you to. I was like, bro, there is no way it works that way. Otherwise, you should get a chair and just slam it in the head and then say to the official, don't DQ me, it doesn't work that way. He also started to clear out in the announce table, but Logan surprised him and switched it around when Paul climbed to the top rope. We got this amazing 360 camera shot. And as soon as the camera was behind Logan, he dove onto Cody Rhodes and broke this thing. Honestly, that looked totally amazing. And WWE's new camera shots are brilliant. He then rolled Rhodes back in the ring for another frog splash where he got the one, two, ooh. And I had this passing second where I was like, oh my gosh, Logan Paul is going to become the world champion. But he didn't. And given how I did feel, I don't think we can ever pull the trigger on that. The referee then got bumped because of course he did when Cody Rhodes busted out a vertebraker. Now, I don't think we have seen the vertebraker in WWE since like 2004, and I'm pretty sure it's on the banned move list. But as soon as Cody did hit it, he tried to wake up the referee because he was pretty confident he was going to win. Of course, this ref was woozy goozy though, which is when Logan Paul took advantage once again, and he hit Cody right in the balls. Once again, I was having a panic attack here. WWE were really teasing. Then went back for the brass knucks. You want to finish this when thankfully Ibrahim Al-Hajiz, who was the special guest ring announcer and a big old local celebrity, stopped him. Of course, Logan Paul couldn't handle that. He turned around. I think Cody shouted, I'm Cody Rhodes, bitch, or something like that, where he hit three crossroads and he got the three. Now, personally, I feel like he should have just hit one. 
And also, I don't think he needed outside help, but it doesn't matter. I have a feeling we're not going to talk about this again. So yes, I was a little taken aback that we did find an out for Logan Paul, but this too was a contender for match of the night because Logan is so damn athletic and Cody Rhodes is just a brilliant, brilliant professional wrestler. So I had a good old time and Cody still is the champ. Give it a nap. You've also got the question you can ask that maybe we could do Gunther versus Cody at SummerSlam because Gunther could jump brands. WWE has done that time and time again. So I'm very excited for the future. And given there was only what, like five, six matches on this thing, I actually think it did a good job in going, whoa, what's gonna come next? Uh, now please do leave me a comment below and let me know what you thought about last night's King and Queen of the Ring, whatever the hell it was called. Like the video, share the video and subscribe. Make sure you click the video on the screen, which is ups and downs for Smackdown, so you can have all my wrestling opinions. And yes, they are all dumb. Otherwise I'll see you tomorrow when we up the downs for double or nothing, because wrestling never dies. Maybe somebody should kill it. Goodbye.